Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special episode of On Brand. We're here today to celebrate International Women's Day, and today we're going to be talking about the business case for building a more diverse <coughs> workforce and a more diverse world. McKinsey recently published some research uh, that showed that if we can advance women's equality in the global economy, we could add $12 trillion to global growth. I'm Sabrina Rodriguez, I'm Global Head of Digital Marketing here at Dan, and with our panel's help, we're going to explore why it is a business imperative that we bridge the gap in gender parity, build diverse workforces, and the businesses and initiatives that are really making an impact and celebrating those. Uh, before we go to the panelists, for those tuning in live, if you do have any questions for the panel, please do leave your comments and questions in the Facebook feed below, or equally, tweet us using the on-brand hashtag and the each for equal hashtag. So uh, before we get started, let me introduce you to our esteemed panel of guests, Anna. <laughs> Um, hello, I'm Anna Longley. I direct Dentsu's Social Impact and Sustainability Strategy, which includes overseeing the global rollout of the Code and Female Foundry, our flagship diversity and inclusion programs. Um, I was previously at BT, where I was Sustainable Business Director, and I'm also a Senior Associate at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Um, and in my other role, I'm a mother of four, a full-time working mother of four, so I understand a little bit about the challenges of working women. Excellent. Thank you for coming, Anna. Jade? Hi, everyone. So I'm Jade Starrett, and I joined Dentsu uh, just over a year ago. I'm Global Head of um, Talent Leadership and Organisation Development. Um, and as of January this year, I'm also taking on the role of Chief People Officer for our creative line of business. Um, before joining Dan, I did a global um, talent role for Experian, the big data business. <coughs> Prior to that, I worked for one of our big global clients, Diageo, for 22 years. Um, and I'm also a working mum of uh, grown up now, uh, twin daughters who are both at university. So uh, understand also the <laughs> trials and tribulations of uh, working motherhood. Well, fabulous to have us uh, have you with us. Um, Leon. Hi, I'm Leon Markham. I'm the uh, Vice President of Market Strategy at Salesforce, uh, who is a Dentsu partner. Um, and really, my role is to advise our executives and sales teams on what's going on in the market, the competitive threats, what's happening with partners and customers. Um, I'm also the president of the, uh, sorry, the executive sponsor for the Salesforce Women's Network uh, in the UK. And I'm also on the board of the Salesforce Women's Network globally. I've been involved in that for, I guess, five or six years now. And uh, yeah, a big part of my additional work is um, around trying to drive uh, fairness and equality, especially around gender. And I'm also a working father of two children who uh, are nowhere near university yet, but uh, just getting to that <laughs> fun tween age, uh, which is <laughs> utterly terrifying. Wonderful to have you with us and really looking forward to hearing more about your work, especially with, with Salesforce. And finally, Anna. Hello. Hi, Sabrina. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Anna Campbell. I'm a global client president at um, Dentsu. So I have over 25 years <coughs> excuse me, experience of working in both client leadership role and across new business. Um, I've recently rejoined uh, Dentsu, uh, Carrot Global, and now lead the um, Vodafone Global business, which is really exciting. Um, I'm also a mum of two, um, and uh, which keeps me busy, and I'm also a proud uh, owner of two horses, uh, which keeps me even busier, um, <laughs> because I spend most of my weekends trailing around the countryside after, <clears throat> after my daughter, who competes British show jumping and British wow. eventing. And uh, I do try and do a little bit of dressage <laughs> here and there. Amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, very, very busy life. Very mm. impressive. Yeah. Um, well, we've obviously got a, quite a huge topic to tackle in just 30 minutes. Um, but I suppose to kick off, Anna, you're obviously heading up our social impact agenda here, but you're also mm -hmm. a regular lecturer uh, for the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership. So um, you obviously have a very deep understanding of some of the macroeconomic challenges that we face and some of the complex societal issues that we also face. Can you tell us a little bit more about that in terms of um, you know, some of the systemic issues around diversity? That's a very big question. <laughs> we have 30 minutes yes. have a go. for people. Have a go. Um, I, think, um, I think it is well understood nowadays that actually society is facing some of the biggest challenges we've ever seen. And um, those include things like biodiversity, climate change, but also inequality. 
and we do talk a lot about climate change and we hear a lot about it on the news but I don't think everybody always realises that inequality is actually increasingly an issue. In the UK it's actually rising faster than any other time since the Second World War. And Oxfam came out with a stat quite recently which had said the eight richest men on the planet hold the same wealth as 3.5 billion people. So you can see the kind of the huge discrepancy. And um, what we're seeing at the moment is, you know, consumers are waking up to this, investors are waking up to this, regulators, and they're calling for change. And in 2015, the United Nations set out a framework to help us move towards a more sustainable society um, and 17 sustainable development goals, um, which were designed to eradicate poverty, um, help us live on a healthy planet, um, foster peace and prosperity for all. But inclusion is actually at the heart of this agenda. Um, and it is, you know, it's the very, very, very heart of the sustainable development agenda. And I think we recognize now that all of these things are interlinked. So we know that um, from a climate change perspective, the people who be the most vulnerable, who are, the, you know, are the poor and the most vulnerable, not necessarily the world's biggest emitters who will be affected by climate change. But we also recognize that actually supporting women and girls to thrive has a knock on impact on multiple development goals. So, you know, health and well-being, for example, in terms of educating girls can improve health and well-being for their children, for their families, for population and societies. Um, we talk about the impact on climate change for population control. But also we need to remember that, you know, 50% of the population are female and within that there are other ethnic diverse, you know, there's um, people from different socio-economic backgrounds, people of different ages. So actually supporting women and girls to thrive actually supports the diversity agenda at at large. Um, and there is a huge economic imperative. So you quoted that stat, $12 trillion. You know, that's a, that's a huge opportunity. I think women, despite being 50%, only contribute 36% of the world's GDP. So there's a growth opportunity yeah. there for society yeah. at all. Amazing. And um, Leon, obviously, we're seeing a lot of um, forces for change, uh, increasingly so, around cross-collaborative efforts to uh, drive that positive change, including companies rallying around the UN's Sustainable yeah. Development Goals. Um, is this something that, you know, sales forces have been involved with? And are you seeing how those initiatives are making a difference? Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, I think Anna's explained brilliantly the, uh, the UN Sustainability <laughs> Goals. And I think, you know, that, that's very clear. And certainly Salesforce was an early signatory to those. And at Salesforce, we really believe that business is the greatest platform for change. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, we'll get into this a, a little bit more later. But business, you can't just see business now as being for the shareholders. Like, it's not just about money. We have to look at all our stakeholders, and that means our customers, uh, you know, great partners like Dentsu, but also like all the stakeholders in society. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to build these coalitions. And one thing that I think is really awesome about the, uh, the UN Sustainability Goals is it's really been helping drive these topics, uh, you know, and gender equality explicitly, but all of these things that lead into gender equality and in general making, uh, you know, creating better outcomes for everyone. It's putting them on, not just on the diversity agenda or just on the equality agenda, but really in the, the mainstream CEO agenda. And if you see, you know, what's been coming out of things like Davos recently over the last couple of years, it's, I think it's becoming a, a top line business goal. And I think, you know, people who've been involved in this world have always talked about that. But when you talk to senior business leaders now, they're all considering, like, what are we doing about climate? What are we doing about equality? What are we doing to make this a better world for or, you know, everyone in the future, because you say this rising inequality, that's scary. And regardless of which side you fall on with questions like Brexit or questions like, uh, you know, the UN pre US presidential elections, there's a crisis of trust. Mm -hmm. And in business, like we have to do something about that. We are empowered to do that, but we have to mm -hmm. do it for the good of everyone, mm -hmm. I think. And Jade, obviously, is sort of chief people officer for the creative mm. line of business and also global director of talent and leadership. I imagine this is really quite high on mm. your radar as well. Um, yeah. But is this important for Dentsu and what are we kind of doing? Yeah, to abso that? absolutely, Sabrina. And, and I would echo everything that both Leon and, and Anna have said. But over, over and above that, I think for me, there are three main reasons why um, diversity and inclusion is an absolute business imperative for for Dentsu. And the first one, you wouldn't be surprised for me to say so, is around our talent. Mm. Um, so, you know, of the 45,000 people we have in, in Dan, 60 across Dentsu globally, um, 
you know, they are the driving force of our, of, our, of our business performance. It's our people that deliver our business performance. We don't make widgets at Down. We don't run factories. It is the collective capability of all of our employees that it, it makes us successful and, and who we are. Um, and we also know that the, the war for talent rages on, um, probably even more fiercely now than when McKinsey first coined the term back in 1997, I think it was. Um, and therefore, it's ever more important for organisations and businesses to really differentiate themselves from their competitors if they truly want to attract the very best talent. Um, and we know, you know, with changing global demographics, that talent pool is massively shrinking. Um, we have an aging population, we have a shrinking youthful population, and therefore it's harder to attract and to keep <coughs> the people um, who are going to really help to, to transform your business. So I think the talent agenda from a diversity point of view is, is massively important. And I did pull out a few stats, I thought they would be helpful for the discussion. So um, at Dan, we lose more women than we do men. So our attrition rate for women is higher than it is for men. It's 27% 20, currently for women and 24% currently for men. And across the whole of the organisation in Dan, we currently have 54% women, which is great. Um, up, up actually from last year when it was more like 50-50. Um, then, like most organisations, the kind of funnel kind of changes. Um, and then our senior population, senior leadership population, we have 32% women, um, which is up again mm -hmm. about uh, from 30% last year, which is again a, pro a positive movement. On the Dan Executive Committee, we have 17% women, which is again an improvement with the appointment recently of Jackie Kelly mm -hmm. as our um, uh, CEO for the Americas. And Jackie herself has done some fabulous things to change the gender balance for the positive since she's been in role. Um, so all positive, all things moving in the right direction, um, but in my mind there is absolutely more that we could do and should do. Um, and not just thinking about the representation, because this is so much more than a numbers game. I think you mentioned inclusion, Anna. Um, I think unless we're thinking about the employee experience as well and, and what that feels like, we're, we're not really going to change the dial around, around diversity. Um, and so we also took a look at um, how do our people, people feel about working here from a kind of gender and diversity point of view. And actually our, our global employee survey check-in doesn't really throw up that much differentiation between men and women. So last year actually for the first time we did an additional more detailed DNI survey amongst our senior leadership population, both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and although we didn't find massive variation, there there were three areas that really did stand out as stark differences and I've just kind of noted those down to remind myself. There was, there was one question which is, I feel I work in a culture that really values diversity. 80% um, of the men that completed the survey agreed with that, but less than 50% of women did. Um, and then again, one in four women said that they did not feel exposed to inclusive leaders at Dan. And that figure was one in 20 for men. Um, and five times the number of women compared to men did not feel there were equal opportunities at Dan. So I think despite the progress we're making, which shouldn't be underestimated, there is absolutely still an area of opportunity for us here. And we have to be bolder and more courageous, I think, to, to really differentiate ourselves in the space of talent. So talent would be a big one for me. Very quickly, I'm conscious I'm speaking too much here, um, but the other two areas I would talk to in terms of why it's important for Dan, the second would be client centricity. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's through winning and growing and, and retaining our, our clients that it's how we survive and how we make business. And our clients are increasingly demanding of us, in fact, that we're able to feel diverse, um, diverse teams to work with and partner with them. Um, almost as a kind of minimum expectation of, of partnership with us. But we also know that um, you know, we're going to have better and deeper understanding and empathy with our clients, customers mm -hmm. and consumers if we represent the diversity that mm -hmm. they do as well. Mm -hmm. So I think client centricity is the big yeah. one. And the third one for me is innovation. So, you know, creativity, innovation ideas is our lifeblood as a, as a business. And we know through so much research that the more diversity of thought, background and experience 
you can have, the, yeah. the more likely you're going to drive um, uh, innovation and avoid groupthink. We're yeah. never going to transform our business if we keep doing things the way we've always done them. We'll just get more of the same. And with that comes thinking differently, and with that comes bringing different perspectives. Fabulous. And is that a, a view that Salesforce shares? Yeah, I, I, I won't say it like that. So, and speaking as you know, the only dude here, it's so <laughs> telling <laughs> that we're all going, no, I think it's totally equal. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, but, the, but the women are, are speaking differently. And I think the, the first point you made of talent is so important. You know, speaking for sales, like Salesforce is a fast growing company in a very fast growing industry. And it's not just about us, it's about all the partners like Dentsu who need to find this talent. And it's a very competitive market. So finding people, and so part, a big part of our strategy is being an attractive um, destination to work for Salesforce or to become part of our partner community. <coughs> so there's a really strong business imperative there to drive it. And, and, and you were also talking about, you know, the, the, it starts off at a certain level and the, you know, as you go further up, and the same is true in, in every industry. Uh, and you know, candidly, you know, the technology industry is, 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 is even worse. And one of the things, uh, Salesforce has a chief equality officer, um, a guy called Tony Profit, who's a, who's, a, who's a brilliant executive. And he's sort of, at this stage of his career, he's really working with us to help drive that equality agenda. And one of the things he always talks about is the importance of being able to bring your whole self to work. Mm. And I remember when I first got involved in the Salesforce Women's Network six or seven years ago, um, it was kind of like I wanted to go to a meeting. I remember there was, there was some film being shown. I was like, oh, that'd be quite interesting. And it was like, oh, I can't really go because it's the Women's Network. It's like, no, come on, I can do it. And then I was, I was thinking about it. It's like, it's going to be weird for me being the only guy in a room full of women. But for certainly women in the tech industry, that's a normal thing. So actually, I should try this. Like, this will be really, and I went in. And it was weird having that, like, oh, what are people going to think about what I say? And because it was California and they were all really nice, within 30 seconds I got a round of applause. For being, it's like, oh, come was on, sisters. The, was that the first time you sort of thought of it like that as well? Yeah, absolutely. As in the consciousness yes. of what you were going to say in front of that audience. Right. Yeah. And so the point, exactly. Yeah, and so dynamic, right? to yeah. make it so that we can have everyone in our organisation being able to present themselves yeah. and not have to not go have through to that go double through thing. That. Yeah. That's like how we get more value yeah. out of people. And that's what we all need. Yeah. So yeah. as much as I'm sure all of us have a personal motivation around what we believe to be fairness and doing the right thing, like yeah. we need to unlock the, yeah. the value mm. from those people. And I think there's a theme that comes from that around confidence. Yeah. And I've been Thinking about a lot about this yeah. over the last couple of days, yeah. and I think we have to empower everyone, whether it's a woman or a man, to yes. feel confident. Yeah. <coughs> excuse me, confident in any situation. So, confident to come in and be themselves. Confident yeah. to be a woman in the 21st century in a leadership role, or coming into the industry, or st starting your career. And I think we underestimate the value that confidence can bring. And I just wanted to pick up on a little theme that uh, Jade was talking about earlier, which is. Um, around the, and, and you were talking about Leon, Leon in terms of it starting at the top of an organisation, but actually there is a responsibility, I think, with, for everyone All within the organisation. Yeah, and, absolutely. you know, having been in this industry for quite a long time now, I suppose I haven't really felt the sort of weight of that responsibility mm -hmm. quite so much as I have in the last couple of years, particularly as my daughter gets older. Yeah. We were talking earlier about our girls <coughs> going off to university, um, so she'll be in the world of work in, in four years, four or five years' yeah. time. And I want her to feel empowered and confident that she yeah. can go in there and absolutely smash it. Obviously, yeah. she's my daughter. Hopefully, <laughs> she will. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, we, I have a responsibility to do that. We all have a responsibility. But also, we need to make the people that work for us feel that mm. that responsibility as well. It mm. can't all be at a senior leadership I level to, <coughs> to, to take responsibility for it and to, and to deliver it. So that was sort of one, one key theme that I think is, is super important. And then the, the, the confidence and the honesty piece is like, I think we just have to, we should celebrate the stuff that we're doing really well. I think let's not always think that it's, we have to do more obviously, but we should be really proud of what we have done um, and celebrate that and then learn from that and then understand how we need to apply that and what do we need to do differently because everything's moving so fast and what's working now, even with the stats and what we need to do will be different, different. in 12 months time. Totally. So. Yeah. 
I would agree with the yeah. celebrating what we've done. Mm. Um, yesterday we launched our Female Foundry Accelerator Programme in the US, which is the sixth country that we've launched in. Um, you know, that's the progress that yeah. we've made in the last six yeah. months. So we yeah. decided we wanted to be committed to actually supporting women to thrive in the digital economy, not just Dan, female mm. yeah. leadership, mm -hmm. but also, you know, women in the yeah. kind of digital businesses that we work with. And we have men and women from Dentsu who are mentoring female-founded startups. We've done 71 to date. We're now live in Singapore, South Africa, um, Mexico, Chile, um, India and the US as of it's yesterday. Brilliant. It's fantastic yeah, it's brilliant. progress. Yeah. It's not just about the narrative, yeah. it's actually going forward mm -hmm. and taking yeah. action. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, uh, we've touched on as well the fact that diversity is something that not just talent expect, but clients expect. And Anna, I'm interested to hear your thoughts kind of working as a global client president yeah. with Vodafone. Yeah. How important is it for A, your team to I be mean, diverse? Now, nowadays, I mean, I cannot tell you how important it is. I think um, <clears throat> uh, we've been working with Vodafone. They're our newest global client. Uh, very exciting uh, and demanding uh, and challenging business to work on right now. But actually, um, you know, a key criteria of that pitch process that we went through was um, uh, the gender diversity that we had across our teams. It wasn't an explicit uh, criteria, um, but every meeting they went to, they were looking at uh, what that balance was, and it was really important for them. And uh, you know, I, I lead a team. My team is predominantly female. My business leader is female. My strategy leader is female. I feel super proud of that. I think that's quite unique within the organization. Mm. And actually I work with, uh, from a Vodafone perspective, the clients that I work with are predominantly female as well. So that feels super empowering. And actually what we've sort of reflected on over the last uh, couple of months is we've adopted a kind of slightly different way of working as well. So um, not necessarily by design, but actually it's fantastic. We're sort of working in a more agile way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of bringing it back to business, um, now in new business pitches, whether it's explicit or, or implicit, there will always be uh, an element around uh, diversity and inclusion. So what I think is important is that um, we are doing it. We, we have to be doing it. Otherwise, how can we be credible? How can we really understand what resonates, what type of experience we need to deliver if we're not walking the walk? Yeah. So. Yes, let's celebrate what we're doing, learn from it, and from my point of view, move on quickly and work out what the next new important thing is to deliver. Mm -hmm. And because clients expect it. Sorry. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I was, I was just going to say, like that clients do expect it. And I know that Anna, your team have been across some amazing case studies as well, where we've driven change with um, a social impact lens, with a diversity lens. Are there any other brands that we work with that you kind of hold to high esteem that are really driving change in that space? Well, the obvious one that probably springs to mind is is Diageo. Um, and the work that they've done, um, not just on gender, but on diversity in general and the way that they actually cast for yep. their advertising to the way they do yeah. their business. Mm -hmm. So we see some amazing work. Um, I love the Captain Marvel work that Vodafone did, I have to say. Yeah. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Captain Marvel campaign. Can I just say, actually, Vodafone today have launched an initiative called um, Change the Face, which is about changing um, the face of technology. Um, mm -hmm. And their whole, and it li literally is a live event today as well, so which is fantastic. Which And their belief is that, <coughs> excuse me, if you don't change the, pe the, the actual faces, yeah. then how can yeah. you actually yes. change the face of technology? So yeah. um, hugely uh, important initiative. Amazing. Yeah, it is fantastic. There's organizations as well that I think we have to recognize. <laughs> IKEA have 50% females on the board. Unilever mm -hmm. has just announced, just announced that they've got 50% yep. 50 yeah. women in senior leadership positions. But that, I mean, that back to the point earlier about this being a business imperative. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, 70% of Unilever's customers are women. Mm -hmm. So it absolutely makes sense. It's a core business driver that their employee base across the world actually reflects and understands that population. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, we talked, you know, you mentioned business ownership earlier, Sabrina. Alan Jope is their CEO, mm -hmm. actually defers their diversity inclusion. It's the same here. So Tim Andre, who's our CEO, he chairs the Social Impact Board Committee. Um, social, you know, diversity and inclusion is a big topic on that agenda. Um, for our female foundry program, we have a female sponsor. We also have a male sponsor, Nicholas Ray, who's been a fantastic champion. Um, and in the US, where we've just launched again, we have Deb Boyder, who's the CEO of Isobar, pioneering that. But we also have Jeremy Kornfeld, who's the CEO, mm. CEO of iProspect. Um, so it's really, really great mm. to have senior leadership from both genders supporting these programs. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. And um, Leon, I'm also interested to hear from a partner point of view as yeah. well, how important diversity is when you're, you're kind of working with clients.
clients. Well, and I, I really wanted to go back to like the importance of div diverse teams working with mm -hmm. clients. So firstly, customers expect it now. They want to see, you know, like customers like Unilever is also a big customer of ours and the people they serve, they want to represent that group themselves and they want to see us representing it. But there's some really interesting research on the value of diverse teams. And certainly, you know, I, I work in the technology industry, which is historically male dominated. And I was talking to a friend of mine who works for a partner organization and talking about, you know, they have this consistent pattern of they hire a successful sales leader or someone who's been successful in the past. They hire a whole bunch of people who look like them, often like him, and they have this incredibly successful quarter or two. Mm. And then at uh, like after a year or 18 months, it's not working. And they're like, why? And they keep on having this surprise. And there's some really interesting research. Uh, I think it's from Corn Ferry about how, you know, this whole model of uh, forming, storming, forming, norming, storm, performing, and performing. I, I, yeah. I, I should <laughs> have had a drink of water. Forming. Thank you. you say that. <laughs> but the point is, like, you can actually get to a certain level of success quicker if you have a non-diverse yes, team, because we all know how to work yeah. with yeah. each other. Like, yeah. we've all, we all went to the same schools. We all yeah. did the same things. We know the of speaking yeah. but you peak yeah and you get to a higher level when you have genuinely diverse sets of opinions definitely and, and diversity isn't just about gender it's about um, your family background mm. it's about your perspective I was gonna say yeah you know <clears throat> and she won't mind me talking about it but one of the ladies in my team she's got ADHD and so you know yeah. that can sometimes have quite big impacts on, right. on on her working her working life and and the way that she works but she's amazing she's mm. absolutely brilliant so why would yeah. I not be a flex to whatever she needs yeah. because actually what she will give me um, and give the client is, is worth it yeah. and, and unique yeah. so and it's yeah. yeah it's more than just the gender piece it's the whole inclusion and the diversity yeah. yeah and I think what's interesting you mentioned that research is that it shows that it actually takes longer to yeah. build diverse yes. teams how do you go about convincing companies that go at such a fast pace and, and they just need bums on seats and I think I think we're in a very similar uh, you know, for Dentsu and for Salesforce, like there's a huge pressure to get people in. You've mm. got hiring targets to fill and we have certain roles where we know. And I, and I think part of it, it has to be cultural. Part of it comes from the confidence of seeing people who've made the right decisions yeah. and be successful, be successful. over time. Yeah. Uh, mm. And I, I would certainly, you know, encourage anyone who's watching this who is a people leader, a people manager, if you're involved in the hiring of people, you can be part of the solution. Yeah. And there's a certain element yeah. of maybe in certain roles, you're gonna to have to take a quarter or two yeah. of extra pressure, yeah. but have the faith and have the confidence mm -hmm. to know it's gonna be successful. And one thing I've seen is there's a ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you see one leader being successful and they're, they're seen as a beacon of that okay what did she do yeah. or what did he do and then people start having the confidence and frankly having these conversations like that's i really appreciate that's having that's the platform to be able yeah. to do it because yeah. you know when we're leaders when we're managers it's not easy to ask about the things that are difficult yeah. like we're expected to do it and we're all you know high performing professionals mm -hmm. and we to ask for that help or to ask for that advice is difficult so i think having these conversations and sharing that stuff mm -hmm. is important Totally. And just to build on that as well, I do think we need to recognise that actually sometimes it won't take a quarter or two quarters, it could take a year or two or three, mm. because we're talking about culture change. Yeah. We're a global organisation, mm. some of our markets are extremely high performing on gender, in the UK for example, we're almost 40%, which is excellent, but we also operate in markets in, like Japan and India, where actually there are cultural yes. dynamics at play, That's which right. are going to take longer, longer to change, and we need to recognise that. Yeah. But what we can do is shine a spotlight on the case studies and the people who are are affecting positive change with fantastic business results. Yeah, yeah, so you mentioned Jackie Kelly yeah. early. Jackie Kelly earlier, for example, yeah. she's the CEO of our U.S. business. When yeah. she was appointed, she reshuffled her team. Yeah. She instantly appointed three more women to her yeah. senior leadership team. Yeah. But she's also outperforming the market with fantastic yeah. commercial results. Yeah. So there's a wonderful case study there absolutely. that we need to to really celebrate. celebrate. Yeah, absolutely. And and. Jade, obviously this has a lot to do with behaviours, right? Mm. In terms of embedding them, totally. scaling them. Totally. How do we do that? At totally. I mean, I think we've all talked about culture, haven't we? And certainly in terms of building an inclusive culture, um, it is all about behaviours, as, as you absolutely say, uh, say rightly. And as we know, in terms of shifting and changing behaviours and culture, that isn't something you do overnight. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely for the, for the long term. And, and as, as Anna has mentioned, these, this isn't just a 
Dentsu issue or a Salesforce issue or a corporate issue. It's a societal issue mm. and, and, and society is dealing yeah. with this enormous uh, re requirement to shift given global demographics and so on. So I think, there, I think there are a few things that we have to do, some of which we've already talked about, but I think um, in, order for, in order for us to really appreciate um, that this is important, I think you do need clear and unequivocal leadership commitment to say that this is important, this is a business imperative, this is a business agenda, not an HR agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and and for, for, from right from the top, all the way through the organisation, to your point uh, as well, Anna, it's not just about leaders, it's about all of us um, having that commitment and that drumbeat that people keep saying that. And I think it's not just the, um, the upfront commitment, it's that it needs the staying power. That needs to be unwavering. Because with culture change, it's not something you can kind of put your foot on and off the, the gas pedal. You need to keep your foot down on the, on the gas pedal. And that can be really hard when times get tough. You know, some our, our recent past, so, yeah. when things get difficult, <laughs> it's too easy, it's all too easy to take, take, the, take the pedal up um, for you know that commitment to waver, if not disappear completely, for budgets to get pulled back or constrained or disappear completely, and that isn't going to help the the kind of change over the long term. So I think I think unwavering leadership commitment is one. I also think in terms of behaviour change, actually building a more empathic leadership is really important. And I think from a gender point of view, to your point, Lee, and I think men and women have to do that shoulder to shoulder. I think that ally is so important. This isn't a women's issue, it's a societal business issue. Um, but I do think if you look at Dan, like most other companies, our senior leadership is predominantly male, it is predominantly of a certain generation. So I think the more that we can do to encourage and to facilitate um, cross-gender, cross-generational dialogue across the business, so people really are starting to more personally understand and empathise with the, um, the challenges of being a working mother in today's um, world is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And things like reverse mentoring, I think, are quite powerful kind of uh, initiatives in that space. Um, two other things I'd say around behaviours. One is around targets. I mean, we are a performance-driven business, and when mm. something's important, we put a target against yep. it, and we relentlessly measure it. And there's that yeah. old phrase, you measure what you treasure. And I think, why would it be any different mm. for DNI? You do have to be careful, because it can build, it can bring sort of unintended consequences. But if you look at the likes of the Diageo and the Unilevers, they are companies that will be setting targets around these things. Yeah. That's where we have made really good progress as well, and it is worth saying that, because, you know, yeah. As of this year, we now have a balanced scorecard which yeah. has a number of sustainability metrics on it. Yeah. From a social impact perspective, Absolutely. we have gender and leadership. Yep. We have um, carbon reduction, which obviously I'm very delighted about. Yep. We have measures on ethics and compliance. Yep. So actually remunerating our senior yep. leadership based on behaviour change yep. Yep. Um, is, is a fantastic carrot. Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and Leon is... is uh, something similar happening well, at yeah, Salesforce? Yeah, absolutely, and I think, I think the data point is really important, and you know, certainly we have those stats shared internally and in, in some cases uh, externally around gender and promotions, and I think that's really important, giving mm. those mm. data. Um, but I, I think there's also something about, like, take a step back, and I think you made a really important point, Anna, like, there are different cultures in different places, and we can't just we believe strongly in equality because we see the business case, but we can't assume that everyone else feels about it in exactly the same, same way, way or go in assuming that we know the best mm -hmm. because we're from a certain country or a certain background. Yeah. And I think it's really important to be sensitive mm. and thoughtful and also listen. I had a really, yeah. there's a, a friend of mine used to run uh, DNI for Dell in Asia Pacific. And she said, uh, you know, it's really interesting how mm. she came there expecting certain countries to be performing a lot worse, but actually it was, it was very different and in mm. many cases ahead of the US. Yeah. I think there's also something about um, 
we all want to get better. Like very few people wake up in the morning going, like, I, I am gonna, you know, I'm gonna perpetuate the patriarchy and promote more <laughs> men than women. Like we get into it, and part of the reason is because of how our brains were wired. Like mm -hmm. we have this concept of heuristics. We have these shortcuts. Like I don't wake up every morning going, I wonder what time of day I should get out of bed. I do it the same way because I've done it all the time. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, that behavior and way of thinking is really useful, but sometimes it isn't yes, because if I just try and hire you know, account executives for Vodafone who look like all the other ones, I will at some point start making uh, mistakes. And one thing we've also driven out yeah. is a lot of work around um, unconscious bias training. Mm -hmm. And really, so unconscious bias training I think is, is awesome and everyone should do it. But also when we're hiring for roles, try not to pattern match against the people we mm -hmm. used to hire for, but really break it down what are specifically the skills we need. Mm -hmm. I had um, an... Um, I was, I was talking to Sabrina about this. I had a, a, a period where I was, in, in one quarter, I had to hire like 20 people. It was an insane number of people. And I, I asked the recruiter, like, I want a balanced stock out. I want 50% women. And we weren't able to get it. So I asked again, like more loudly. And we, you know, we just weren't in spite of trying to source female candidates. And we really had to look at mm -hmm. some of the basic stuff we were doing. Like it turns out that when you put out a job advert, if you put out requirements, if a woman doesn't have doesn't all ten of them, yeah. she won't yeah. whereas a, a guy will be like, I've got two, it sounds close Easy. enough. Yeah. Um, I'll have a go. And, and there's certain kinds of words that people use. So there's certain ways of thinking that, you know, yeah. I certainly, I was very deliberately setting out to not do this, but because I didn't know some of the things, yeah. I hadn't. Yep. And so I think like that training, that yeah. enablement, really that does. empowerment, mm -hmm. and also accepting like people do want to make a difference. We're yeah, all yeah. coming at our own different paces and different yeah. organizations and different cultures have different requirements and different ways of learning. And that insight yeah. and that listening point is also really, really important because actually I yeah. prospect have done some amazing research called Hear Her Voice in different regions. Um, and, and the barriers facing women in the workplace do change and they shift. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Asia Pac, you know, it's access to networks. Women don't have access to the same networks as their male counterparts. But right. in LATAM, it's access to funding. So most people female entrepreneurs in Latin America are self-funding mm. because they can't get they bank can't, loans, yeah. but their male counterparts can. So I think where we can understand mm. those insights and those issues, we can help our own people yeah. mm. to understand what barriers and support they need. And actually women yeah. maybe do need different support at different phases and stages of their careers yep. than men mm. do, and we should recognize that. Yeah, we were talking about that yeah. in the last panel, actually, the importance mm. of networks for everyone, not just yeah. women, yes, I think. Definitely. You know, we were talking about uh, the BAME network, which Venya is just um, about to uh, launch here in here yeah. in the UK. Um, so I think it's it's valid for everybody. Um, I'm just going to quickly move to uh, some of the questions that are coming through the feed. Um, the first one's quite interesting. Um, there are many stats and studies that have shown diversity is better for business. Why are we still struggling to see change? Is it about winning both hearts and minds? Who wants to take that one? Well, I was quite interested, Sabrina, when we were chatting last week with Jade, um, where you talked about the narrative that you might have internally about gender, for example. Mm. And actually, your philosophy was that actually, if you're talking about this organization, we should be talking about female capital. Mm. So I think sometimes, you know, it, it is that point that we actually forget this is a commercial agenda. And if we talk about diversity and if we talk about women in business, sometimes people do think it's a softer issue. Mm. But actually, the way that you phrased it on female capital, mm. it, it's what we sell. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. what our business is pure, um, mm. powered by. Um, and if 50% of our population is female, then, mm. you know, we really need to be looking at that, investing in that in the same way we would physical infrastructure. Mm. So I think there's definitely something there about making the business case internally and using the right language. Yeah. I yeah. do think it's about that point about unwavering commitment as yeah. well, though, because I think that, I think most people that you'd speak to, I think there'd be very, very few people that you'd speak to that don't, mm -hmm. don't get the business case. I think, you know, yeah. most people genuinely do. Yeah. But when there's a when there's a whole list of issues yep. and challenges and priorities, it's too easy, as I was saying, for this one to fall down. I so I think it is that unwavering commitment to say this is important. And yep. yeah. I know that's important too, but we're gonna stick. Because the reality is it's hard, right? It's yeah. hard. It's, not, it's, really it's really hard. hard. And I think yeah. everyone will recognise at whatever level in the business you yeah. are 
and whatever area of DNI that we're talking about, it's yeah. hard. It's just yeah. really hard. So, to your point, if we can have that commitment and then the power of the collective, yeah. then the, you know we are seeing the shifts. Yeah. As I said, let's celebrate what we have what done. What we have done, yeah. um, and recognise the hard bits, yeah. and therefore maybe that requires a little bit of extra focus yeah. going forward. Yeah. I do think things are yeah. going to change quite quickly because it's like the broader sustainability agenda. Mm. Investors a year ago weren't asking Dentsu about ESG, yeah. whereas mm. now 80% of yes. our investors are asking us about yes. ESG. Yeah. They're asking us about our climate targets, but they're also asking about how many women we do have yes. on the board. Yeah. And it is to avoid that point that Jade was making earlier about groupthink. Yeah. Because yeah. actually, if you have, um, you know, if every single person on your board yeah. is from the same socio-demographic background, the same yeah. gender, the same colour, yeah. then essentially they can't spot the risks or the no, opportunities. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. what investors yeah, exactly. are, are concerned about. Yeah. Uh, one thing I find really heartening is the people who are earlier in their careers joining the workforce yeah. now, they have a very different, different set of expectations. Definitely. And they're definitely. sort of coming in with these expectations and they're teaching us. That's and I think mm, I find that right. really inspirational. Yeah, yeah. And I think totally just to add great. to that point, that <clears throat> JJ, you were talking about the empathy thing. I think mm. we should really shouldn't underestimate the um, how important empathy, mm. particularly with that next generation, mm. is going to be mm -hmm. in ensuring that um, we've got those type of skill sets to deal with that new generation yes. of workforce coming through. Yeah, And empathy is also one of the greatest tools we have for actually doing business because yeah. our, we're in the business of affecting behaviour change. One of the yeah. most powerful ways of doing that is em through empathy. Yeah. We need people who understand it. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Um, and then one other question is around where diversity should actually sit in terms of responsibility in the business. Jade, do you have a view on well, that? Well, I think we've all said Everywhere. it. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's, a business, it's a business agenda mm -hmm. item, so it should sit with the business from the CEO right down. But I couldn't agree more with Anna. Everybody, all of us have a role to and, play. And we need to make people feel comfortable doing it as yeah. well. So, and if they can see that coming from mm. the top and, you know, through the team leadership, mm. then, you know, my, my team are then engendering that in the people that they're working with, then mm. it slowly starts to snowball, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I want to ask one last question of all of you. Uh, this year's theme for International Women's Day is Each for Equal. So what I'm interested to hear is how you interpret that yourself. So Anna, how do you interpret that? Well, I think I would echo what Jade said earlier about shoulder to shoulder. Um, you know, I've been extremely lucky to have um, amazing coaches and mentors in my career who have been men mm. and who have given me fantastic corporate advice, business advice, mm. um, at, given me access to networks and support. Um, so I think, you know, we need to recognize that we have mutually comp complementary qualities Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, women can coach and men to men, men should coach and men to women. And in doing so, we will understand each mm -hmm. other, we'll create empathy and mm -hmm. I think power our business forward. Absolutely. Fabulous. Jade. I was drawn to the concept of collective individualism within that, which I think really kind of resonated for me. And as a as a as a woman, as a working mom, as a very I have a very diverse ethnic background as well. And in the in the course of my career in my life, I've been incredibly fortunate to have worked with and met people from all over the world, all walks of life, all shapes and colours. Um, and the one thing I think I've learned from all of that is there is far more that joins us and mm -hmm. binds us together than there is that makes us different. Uh, and I think while we can celebrate our individual differences, actually when we come together, what we can <coughs> achieve together is, is endless. So, uh, Amazing. Yeah. Love it. I, I wish I'd said what <laughs> that was awesome. the, the pressure um, builds for each person. But, um, but I, I, I think I think to me what it what it says is um, we'll know we've been successful when all of us consider equality to be a personally important issue when the men consider gender equality just as important as women do, when we're all concerned about equality for, uh, you know, regardless of sexuality, regardless of ethnic background, regardless of faith. I think for me, it's when the, when the, when the guys worry about it as much, I think then we will know we've been successful. Yeah, brilliant. And Anna, last but not least. Pressure. <laughs> Um, for me, I think it's um, it's the increments. It's probably, as I said, going back to the personal responsibility that I take and the, the little differences that I can make. Um, and so whether that is uh, mentoring someone, whether that's um, providing an opportunity to someone junior in my team to, to meet with someone senior in the team, to uh, just to make a little difference every day, to even if it's to push people who are struggling because they don't mm. think they can they can balance the work and the life and, and home and everything else. Um, so, in, and I think those little increments uh, yeah. build up into something bigger. Yeah. yeah. 
Little Amazing. Yeah. yeah, wonderful messages to, to land on. And thank you so much for joining us today. I know I'm coming away from it feeling very, very inspired. And I hope everyone who has tuned in and engaged with us today has also feel very inspired. Thank you for your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but do uh, tune in soon when another On Brand episode will come your way. But for now, happy International Women's Day and have a wonderful day. <laughs>